Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the Ubermensch of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am the Death Metal Guy, aka Anti Cosmic Pastafarianism. <laughs> kind of same difference, right? Uh, <laughs> and I am the Black Metal Guy, aka I have played punk but needed metal. I have played metal but wanted punk. Uh, <laughs> which is the. The, the highly relatable description on the page of a Japanese metal punk band called Military Shadow. <laughs> we're, we're, real quick, weren't you saying, because I thought about using that AKA last episode, and you said, well, dude, it mm-hmm. makes perfect sense because it's about making the universe all wiggly like a noodle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's like, you know, if you're anti cosmic it's like, we are all souls imprisoned in the Ajna plane by the Demiurge, and like, uh... You know, we must, you know, we're, like, rigidly confined to determinate forms, and, you know, uh, we must, you know, liberate ourselves from this, this, you know, flesh prison by making the universe wiggly. Like, (laughs) Tiamat, queen of the voiceless sea, fulfill the twilight prophecy, unleash your hatred on mankind, and make the wiggles in the final strife. Are those Absu lyrics? Great darkness, (laughs) supreme ruler of wiggliness. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck is that from? (laughs) Um, That's dissection, man. That's from, uh, yeah, yeah, that's from. Dissection lyrics, I mean. That's from Rian Chaos, man. That's a great song. (laughs) I just listened to to the Metallica riffs, dude. Dude, I don't fucking pay attention to the lyrics, God. Dude, the lyrics the lyrics are the best part because you can tell he you can tell one reason he decided to write like the black album Black Metal was like to indoctrinate children. <laughs> okay. Like yeah, he that's he, pretty he, cool. wa- he wanted like audible anti cosmic Satanist lyrics. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give it to him. He was dedicated to it. But anytime, yeah. anytime someone's tried to explain anti-cosmic Luciferianism to me, it's made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's, so. uh, it's, it's like Christianity, but with a lot more stabbing. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, like, it's, it's, like most evil religions, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so we've got a show. Um, Let's talk. Let's talk about this metal punk stuff. You know, what? What? Uh, yeah. Also, what the fuck is metal punk? I'm still waiting on a real definition of that. Yeah. Well, we tried that with that Finnish band. We tried to describe it. What was the um? Who? What, what were they called again? They had. They had some very. Actually, they had some like. Uh, Reign of terror. Reign of terror. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With R A I N Finland. Yeah. Uh, they. Yeah. So I think it is a. Uh, it is a nebulous term, but, um, you know, the two main configurations are, I think, English and Japanese, and, you know, the English were people from the early D-beat and, yeah, UK-82 scene, so that's, like, stuff like GBH, like, discharge-influenced stuff that wouldn't cut it as, like, brutal D-beat or whatever, mm-hmm. but people from that scene um, getting really into Iron Maiden you know, yeah. or getting into thrash metal in a certain way that was like, you know, is Amoebix metal punk? I don't know. Maybe it's a kind of it. But, like, these bands aspired to the more, like, uh, you know, lead guitars and, like, attempts at technical flourishes and, like, solos and conventionally epic stuff rather than just da 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 you know? Um, the, uh... Uh, in, and so, you know, the classic examples are, like, Sacrilege and English Dogs, who I've still never really gone back and listened to. I think it was too Iron Maiden for me when I was a kid, uh, the, um, which now I'd probably appreciate. Uh, but the, um, um, what else, you know, um, those, the, oh, Broken Bones, obviously, which we've talked about before in connection with Impaled Nazareth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you know, which is Bones from Discharge playing, like, ripping Iron Maiden music. Broken Bones is a pretty, like pretty good version of the English synthesis. And for the Japanese, you know, it just is, as we've talked about, it's like a cultural, it's like certain kinds of hard and fast distinctions that existed in the West were not as important to them because they discovered, this was this music was all coming from a different place and it was just heavy, aggressive music from Europe and America, right? So mm-hmm. they, and more Europe, right? Metal punk is all like rooted in, you know, there's thrash in America, but the metal punk thing is rooted in, you know, like, uh, 
you know, European hardcore, basically, and mm-hmm. and you new wave of British heavy metal and shit. So the um so you get Jism in Japan, and then the other, which is you know, as you've said, Jism is not like as aggressive as you would expect it to be. It's very strange. I I've actually I the other night I was watching. Um, I got drunk and I decided to throw on that uh, that Jism video that they'd released at one point. You know, I, going with the flamethrower. Uh, no, this was a this was like a, a VHS tape of like a concert or something or like mm-hmm. a series of shows, and somebody's ripped it onto YouTube, so it's available. <clears throat> and what's fascinating is um, between the actual songs, they would play this like really weird rhythmic noise stuff mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. with, with, with uh, the vocalist just kind of like gurgling with effects and shrieking and stuff and every time I would hear that I'm like oh that's that's what Jism sounds like and then they'll play a song that's just like jangly fucking first Iron Maiden album riffs over D-beats and stuff it was very strange <laughs> yeah well it's a, it's a very aggressive vocal presence um, yeah, and yeah. then like the and you know the music is aggressive it just is like when you hear it when you hear Jism mentioned in the same vein as just like musically sort of extremely abrasive chugging stuff like Amoebix or like just charging stuff like Discharge or whatever, right? You think it's you think it's like some lost Japanese version of Creator, right? Uh, well, but I'm, it's I'm like expecting like Scum by Napalm Death, basically. Exactly, exactly. And the point is, it's actually part of an earlier moment, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. Like when what is our chronology on Jism? Yeah, so 83, <laughs> great punk hits, the split in 83, right? <laughs> then they have Detestation in 84, uh, and, you know, that's the big one. Yeah. Um, and so that happens really... Uh, kind of before Thrash is even fully... Developed. Yeah, his yeah. Kill 'Em All out the year before. Yeah, Kill 'Em All um, 83. Exactly. So it happens, like, and you know, when what's our, our Bathory timeline is... Uh, I think 84 you know, for Black Oak. Yeah, first Bathory is 84, and first Hellhammer is, I think, 83. Something like that, yeah. Y- yeah, 83. So this ex- so Jism exists exactly in that time period, and you can hear how it is like... You can hear how Jism's extreme music, but mm-hmm. there's just a bunch of sort of stuff that is being... Uh, you know, just like in Hellhammer, you can hear these vestigial rock and roll riffs. Right mm-hmm. and like almost more in Celtic Frost, um, the uh, you know J- Jism just has this strange thing of you can hear the discharge and then there's just this Iron Maiden superimposed on it, yeah. and and it moves at tempos that are closer to like the boogie shuffles of New Wave of British Heavy Metal, even when they're turned into these strange grinding shuffling dishwasher rhythms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's very weird music. And then you can hear that early Japanese noise stuff on the vocals. Right? Definitely. Um, so, after so, military right. shadow, what do we, what do we have here? Let's, let's bring us, bring us up to date. Uh, oh yeah. Well, so, so like in terms of, so military shadow is just this, this cool band that, uh, I found on Bandcamp. I don't even know what their physical release situation is. Like, I think they have, um, they have a CD of their first release, Blood for Freedom, which looks like a short punk style full length. Uh, I don't even know what label it's on. Um, but they must have a label and they must be they must be written up and known in the punk scene because punks, you know, shit their bricks over stuff like this, <laughs> right? Um uh and and you know, there must be something like some Japanese label putting out their stuff. But they've got an English language bandcamp page and, you know, uh th- their last two records were twenty twenty. Uh I bought Metal Punk Iron Fist when it came out, but just kind of forgot about it. And then uh they just released this record, Violent Rain, which is like an E P. Um Well, I look I looked it up actually apparently so this was physically released on cassette a couple years ago. This is the first time it's been available digitally, so in essence, mm. the first time it's been available outside of Japan in any. Who did the cassette release? Oh, let me pull it up. They're actually on Metal Archives. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of that stuff isn't, you know. Um, it's all I guess I guess a Metal Archives thing would be like if it actually has like Iron Maiden riffs in it, it qualifies or something. Yeah. You know, so it looks like it was um, on a, a label called Black Conflict um, mm-hmm. back in 
December of 2020, did a cassette release, and then there was a CD on Novembre Records, uh, but just mm. like a limited edition, like a hundred copies, probably pro CDR thing. And yeah, now we've got the digital edition now. But in essence, this is the first time anyone's going to have heard it. Yeah, um, unless. I bet the punk scene has. Okay, Black Conflict, Punk and Crust since 2004. Where is this contact? This is in... Malaysia. Malaysia. Okay, that makes sense. So it sort of exists out there. Um, American punk scenes do track what's happening. Maximum Rock and Roll used to track stuff happening out there and whatever. So, But um, anyway, so as far as metal people being aware of this, probably now right uh it's weirdly it's well i think i said this before japanese metal punk and extreme crust and like uh noise core are highly relevant to people in our neck of the woods but are not as well known the cult for that music exists in the punk scene uh and um so yeah military shadow are if jism sounds like just strange and kind of abstract Military Shadow are basically the same influences processed into a package that I think might make more sense to your ear. Okay. And there are a few bands in between that are mediating that. So, like, uh, um, they would be really influenced by that band I played in an interlude when we reviewed... You know, we reviewed that Danish band that had this very... Uh, um, Oh, I know had, talk about had this kind of metal punk yeah. thing, yeah, and and I played some some Kuro and some Gestunk on the interlude, right? Uh, and Kuro did their first release around exactly the same time, maybe like yeah, same time as Jism '84, uh, and that's like sort of heavily just fuzzed out, aggressive uh, stuff that's basically like noisier Motorhead meets Discharge, um, really good. Uh, and at the same time, Gestunk were, like, started as a punk band, but they started playing this, like, weird gothy speed metal, mm-hmm. um, which has awesome riffs, um, and but is awesome elaborate riffs, uh, doesn't exactly sound like metal. Military Shadow is drawing on all of those things, uh, plus bands that have happened since, like Crow, especially the more recent Crow record, and also a band from Sweden called Syphilitic Vaginas. Do you know um, them? I, I'm familiar with them. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're directly, uh, well, I mean, that's directly pulled from Jism, so. Yeah, it was a tribute to the Japanese metal punk thing, and it also pulls it into something that's a little more a modernized. Little more, yeah. more modernized, more metallic, more shreddy. And there's quite a range of sounds he does. But, okay, so let's listen. So one cool thing about Military Shadow is you get the, you really do, a lot of bands from this scene are more on the punk side or whatever, this man really pulls in the high flying speed metal stuff that makes this stuff kind of unique. So uh, let's listen to the title track, Violent Rain. I think this one's the jam from the record. And for metal people, this is a good place to start because it's got a very speed metal feel. Uh, and let's listen just, you know, a couple minutes. Give it a shot. This is the last track on the record. <laughs>
Pretzel, what do you make of that? Uh, that's that's actually pretty interesting because for me, it's um, you know, you, people use the term metal punk as though it's this even fusion, but what I'm hearing there is <clears throat> pretty much straight NWO, BHM, and speed metal riff forms just laid on top of punk rhythms and vocals. You know, like there's there's yeah. almost no direct intersection musically between the ideas. It is one set is playing one style and the other is playing another, which is interesting. I mean, obviously all the old uh, NWO, BHM, and speed metal stuff had a lot to do with punk, but specifically the way some of those riffs are articulated, like that that kind of shreddy uh, kind of trill riff that they keep coming back to. I mean, that sounds like 50 riffs I've played for you on various, like, uh, just forgotten NWO, BHM, 7 inches and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the trill riff is awesome, um, and that's um, you know that's the very speed metal part. The thing, I mean, I think there's some blending at like uh, the second part, particularly um, the the sort of like where you get the speed metal hook and then the vocals come in over like you know da 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 very weird chord voicing there. Well, so what happens there is that like the first three chords come in like a like a a D beat riff. Mm-hmm. They're sort of dissonant, smashed out power chords over the, the syncopated thing. And then the rhythm stays the same, but it starts turning around and adding more strings to the chords mm-hmm. and sounding like it's a heavy metal chord progression. It's a really interesting hybrid riff that like doesn't have a seam in it. Yeah, no, it's a, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think I was thinking in terms of like, if you break it down into the root notes, it still has something to do with uh, like 83 type sound which i guess makes sense for talking mm-hmm. jism and metal punk and stuff mm-hmm. um, it's the it's the added kind of chord voicings that make it informed by modern extreme metal there oh yeah i could hear that yeah for sure i think you know a lot of it also does sound kind of like diamond head i um, mean the sort of like d beat continuous d beats with the sort of more elaborate uh more elaborate metalish riffing over it, but yeah, I just like the way that that sort of turns around from a dis, you know, a discord riff into more metal stuff at the end of it. Um, it's, it's cool. It's actually got a really dynamic sort of, especially toward the end of that sample, you start to hear this interesting kind of expansion of ideas, structured mm-hmm. almost like a black metal song, A B A B, and then it starts spinning off. Not just C back to A, but C, mm-hmm. D, and you start doing prime variations on those, you know? hmm Yeah, so here's a question. Another band I've heard in connection with stuff like this is, um, oh, yeah, so, like, band camp, people with band camp accounts, right? Most of them, although I'm guilty of having one, right? Most of them suck. Or rather, <laughs> the people who, rather, that's not fair. Tons of people have band camp accounts, and we encourage people to buy things on band camp. The people you see regularly writing reviews on band camp, Right. Sometime I'd love to do a bonus episode where I just read these people's reviews, right? <laughs> or just like the black metal guy's top 10 most hated band camp reviewers. But a- occasionally, you know, occasionally you're like, aha, you know, you, you are, I see you're a man of culture as well. Um, and one of them is this guy, Invalid Dream Exception, who appears to be actually Japanese. And he has, he has a lot of black metal and, you know, good taste. But he reviewed Metal Punk Iron Fist on band camp and he says, Speed metal, metal punk with passion. Uh, for bands of Death Hammer, Devil Master, X Japan, Gastunk. You would know X Japan better than me. That's like sort of Japanese, Japanese heavy speed metal kind of stuff, right? Like almost maybe an influence on the Visual K stuff. Uh, yeah, it was definitely prime for Visual K. Um, yeah, it's like, it's speed metal-y, but it's definitely moving in a power metal direction, and and they never, they always had a certain kind of punk rhythmic sensibility, but ultimately, X-Japan has a lot more to do with, um, big arena, you know, AOR shit, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and prog stuff. You know, mm-hmm. X Japan is a band that got so into prog rock, or mm-hmm. at least its expansiveness. They just kept playing it faster and heavier, and it mm-hmm. became speed metal basically. But X Japan, in and of itself, is a germinal seed of basically all Japanese heavy music at this point. So, 
I mean, depending upon your perspective, there's part of that in just about everything from the island. Interesting, yeah, probably. It's it's the funny thing is you think, oh, maybe that was an influence on Chisholm. Uh uh-uh. uh. Demo is in the year that Detestation comes out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well I mean X Japan mm-hmm. was uh old, but I mean they didn't even really pick up outside of Japan until probably the early nineties. Word, yeah, well it looks like their for definitive full length comes out in eighty eight. Oh man. Dude, oh shit, if you look at the original cover art for Vanishing a Vision this is where oh, yeah. it's uh yeah pretty pretty uh pretty yeah, spicy like, but yeah, it's it's kind of like their take on a uh, wasp uh, you know fuck like a beast uh-huh. yeah but I was gonna I was gonna say that that is where that must be where that perturbator guy gets all his cover art ideas from because that's that's literally a perturbator cover oh is it <laughs> mm-hmm. that's interesting it's not like literally that but like you know they all have this. That whole aesthetic is based on this horrifying, like, fake idea, fake pastiche idea of, like, 80s mainstream culture or whatever. And I always assumed that, like, and you can tell it, like, doesn't look like any actual 80s stuff. But then, like, here is a thing. Like, literally that exact kind of 80s anime drawing or something Mm -hmm. is, like, what Perturbator puts on his records. Yeah. Like, like, you know, tits and a knife. (laughs) Right. <laughs> um, it's also all right. The, the real defining album. It's Dahlia in '96. It's the last one. No one says it, but I believe it. <laughs> oh, for for X Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mm-hmm. my favorite. But they're all great. All they're right. Great. Well, anyway, let's let's do one more track. So, what do you want to hear? Um, if, do you want to hear one that is more on the punk sound? Do you want to hear another high flying speed metal one? Maybe even more metally. Or do you want to hear some noisy, sakevi shit? You know, I think in this case, just because the first one was so distinctly speed metal, I, I want to hear what the more punk side is like. All right. So in that case, do you want something that's like charging D-beats, or do you want sort of abrasive, weird abrasive noise stuff? Let's just let's just go charging D-beats. I want to hear what these All guys right. center on, you know? All right. All right, good. So let's go to Scars of War. We'll listen to the whole thing. It's just over two minutes. reason punk can't just sound like that all the time musicianship 
<laughs> I mean, it's it's so good. If if punk all sounded like that, every metalhead would be a punk too. Like that's <laughs> yeah. that's phenomenal. Like I like that more than the first song. I like the first song a lot, but that one is like, give me that for an entire record. I mean, I think I agree that that's a perfect perfect fusion of the two sides. Well, yeah, and it's like it it, it reminds me of. You know the the kind of kicks that I get from like Disfear or Martyr Dodd, but more legitimately scrappy. You know, mm-hmm. it's I mean that's phenomenal. And like, I mean, does it really come down to musicianship? I mean, that's not like a, a crazy riff, that little lead riff. I mean, but it's oh, oh it was it, it's a ju- I, I jest right, <laughs> but but I mean I think there's something where the metal bands who are interested in that kind of florid riffing aren't interested in being super aggressive they're often interested in a certain kind of affected retro aesthetic Mm, right whereas whereas the whole thing that jism does which might sound strange in jism but gets refined over time is like why can't we have these like pyrotechnic heavy metal riffs in a context of like genuine extreme music which is in a weird way an idea that extreme metal is finally finding its way back to with stuff like mongrel's cross or uh you know um fucking a morgal or even cromlech you know yeah Mm. i get what you mean it's just like Mm. i mean i hear that and that makes perfect sense that's intuitive to the metalhead well and it's also i I was kind of like jokingly thinking to myself yeah i like this because this is just an impaled nazarene song (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. well we've talked about how impaled nazarene were always tapped in impaled of all the main extreme of all the canonical early 90s bands impaled nazarene are the ones that have something to do with this specific metal punk tradition like, they would have been listening to Broken Bones, they might have been into the Japanese bands, they... exactly the same energy. Yeah, it's, um, it's phenomenal. Like, I wish... It's... Well, it's a, it's a juxtaposition of things... You, you know what I like? I like that it has this, like, florid, almost emotive riff, mm-hmm. but that's not used to make it, like oh, this is a song you're supposed to think to. No, you're still supposed to, like, try to break someone's nose in the pit to that. Oh my god, it's listen to how like, fast the drums are under that. It's just a cool hook riff to remember as you're stomping someone out in the pit and, like, glassing yeah. them and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about being, like, sick and epic while you do it. You know? it's <laughs> You know, you're, like, riding a motorcycle around. You're, you know, um... Y- you know, you've got... Yeah, it's I rode, um. I rode my motorcycle into the venue while they're playing, and I'm just doing burnouts and throwing bottles <laughs> at the crowd the whole time. <laughs> well, it's like that classic thing from the Hanatarash. You you know you know that story, right? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, the, the bulldozer uh, the, through the venue. Oh, was that a? That, I think that was a. Was that Gero Gary Gega Gay? You might know better than me, to be honest. But yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I still haven't it's, seen video of it. Who knows if it actually... I, I, I don't know if it's pronounced gay, 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 but... Uh. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's supposed to be like... You know, it's supposed to be the yeah, sound yeah, of yeah. Like shitting and vomiting at the same time. But yeah, anyway, the other thing I want to say about that song, right? So you've got the drums just driving it, and the vocal performance on that. It, it was a little more restrained on the more heavy metal one, but the vocal performance on that one just... We both cackled as soon as he came in. Oh yeah, just start puking, please. <laughs> Shut up, I'm 
right, we are back uh, with the uh, the meat of our episode, so to speak, and this is gonna be uh, this is gonna be an interesting one. This is kind of like an old um, 2020 terminus episode where we've got two independent releases. Um, but before we get into what they are, yeah, yeah, I know you guys skipped the first part and you thought you were gonna get away with it, but now that you're here, you have to follow us on social media. You can follow me, the Death Metal Guy, on Facebook at Terminus Extreme Metal. Or, excuse me, no, I got that wrong. At Terminus Podcast, or the Black Metal Guy on Instagram at Terminus Extreme Metal. I got that right, right? Yeah, I can never remember. Yeah, I think so. I'm on the Instagram. Let me see what it is. <laughs> New levels of professionalism for 2022. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Terminus Extreme Metal. Yeah. Uh, in addition... If you really want to support us in the Terminus Co-Prosperity Sphere, you can follow us on uh, Patreon or Subscribestar. $3 and up gets you access to the Terminus Prime bonus episodes, and $5 and up gets you access to the Terminus Black Circle, our private Discord server, where we're constantly chatting about all numbers of things, both interesting and not. Um, so beyond that, let's actually get into the show. So the first record we're going to be tackling tonight is, uh, I guess, not quite the debut record, although it feels like it. These guys have put out a ton of material very quickly. Uh, but the second full length by Isatai uh, from Los Angeles uh, with a record called Invoking in Darkness. Now, uh, so Isatai really only started in 2021, and they've released this big series of EPs and splits and what have you, um, which is usually not a great indicator of quality, but bear with us, this is actually pretty interesting. So uh, it appears that this is, at least in part, the follow-up project to a band called Cult of Odium, also from Los Angeles, who we uh, we covered in brief in like a news segment last year. Uh, we thought they were pretty interesting. And when, uh, when I was picking out records for this episode, I was listening to this, and I was like, you know, that really reminds me of Cult of Odium. Well, it turns out that uh, Ruben, the main instrumentalist in this band, was, I believe, the primary songwriter for Cult of Odium, and this follows in a really similar trajectory uh, in terms of uh, guitar style and melodic ideas. Um, so now that that kind of prelude is done... Uh, black metal guy. You oh, know the- and we featured Cult of Odium on one of these pre-show segments, um, like six months ago or something. Yeah, I said that. Oh, oh, sorry, blah. <laughs> well, you're not even gonna fucking listen to me. Is this how we do this show now? <laughs> I was on their Metal Archives page. You never hold me after, you know. I just found out an interesting fact. He has a Satanic War Master tattoo. Well, that's always a ringing endorsement. Um, yes. With, with zero irony, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, with all the preamble out of the way, uh, I really enjoyed this record, and I wasn't sure how you were going to feel about it for various reasons, but it turned out that you really enjoyed this one, too. So, um, how would you how would you describe this? Obviously, it's a black metal band, but it's, it's inter- I think the way you described it in the notes was really good. Oh, cool. All right, then I'll roll with that. Yeah. So I really like this. Um, It is very unique. um, And it is... uh, There's an understated sophistication there, but it is also... I mean, and what a pleasant... You know, uh, this is a breath of fresh air in the US US BM Underground. It is also uh, bludgeoning. (laughs) Um, And uh, I think what it does is... You'll immediately hear the Satanic War Master influence in the guitar style. And, yeah, like you said, some Sar guys, too. Just the franco finish stuff. He's very interested in this, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of noble-sounding corded melodies that the Finns are really into. But he has a unique way of doing them, really emphasizes the sort of much more... Uh, much more scowling and at times kind of downcast and melancholy uh, and much very dense nuanced chords like you said and he's taking that Franco finish thing and he's bridging it uh, to DSBM and the kind of Avski stuff 
that existed at exactly the same time as the original Finnish bands in the trench coat era, in the early two mm-hmm. thousands. Um, and the Franco Finnish stuff is coming in, especially the Finnish stuff as it was back then, not as the formula it's become. Uh, and he's seeing it as part of the same ecosystem as these other things that were related to it back then, right? If you were a black metal, you know, in the early 2000s, right, the satanic war master sound bled over into DSBM. Like, yeah. it influenced the kind of one of the first styles long before we had, you know, everything was this kind of, like, quote-unquote mellow black or whatever. Long before any of that, right, one of the first things that had homogeneously consonant kind of epic sounding riffs was DSBM, and they got that in part from Satanic Warmaster. Um, and on the other side, if you were a black metal purist, well, you might really like Satanic Warmaster and Sargeist and Goat Moon and Horna, and you would also really like stuff like Avski and Kraft, mm-hmm. uh, Catharsis. Um, neither of us like Kraft or Catharsis that much, but we both really like Avski. There's yeah. a bunch of this kind of like stomping, um, stomping neo hellhammerisms on this record. Uh, so it's like, it, it's almost like what the thing is, it's not this kind of throwback early 2000s kind of. It's not this game of reproducing this kind of transitional sound like Gallows were doing. Mm-hmm. It is. It's about producing a new thing, drawing on all that stuff, and it's very modern because it's got this Franco Finnish thing going on, and so that will pull people in. And it's sort of like you know you you come for the you come for the motorcycle jacket, you stay for the trench coat. <laughs> yeah, and mm-hmm. I I think that that's something we both picked up on, which is. Mm-hmm. That this has um, melodically a lot of the kicks you get out of modern kind of Franco Finnish black metal. I mean, clearly these are guys who are acquainted with that style and probably like a lot of it. But the vibe of it is totally early to mid 2000s. Um, I had written in the mm-hmm. notes uh, on one of our bonus episodes, a, uh, a patron had uh, submitted the Amputator record, uh, Death Cult by mm-hmm. Eric Hell. And you described it as the kind of thing that you were listening to off, uh, like, blog spot, like, download blogs mm-hmm. back in the mid to late 2000s. And this is my version of that. So much of the stuff that I was listening to uh, kind of in my high school years was stuff very similar to this. And I think mm-hmm. something that's also worth noting is despite the, um, the, the contiguous nature of the melodies with franco finnish black metal, one of the things that makes this, I, I think, resolutely USBM in a way, is the kind of stark minimalism of it, um, mm-hmm. which is definitely worthy of note here. We've got, like, the production has a deliberately kind of muted flat quality, the drum machine is very simple, not flashy, smart beat switches, but very disinterested in sounding like a drummer. Uh, This reminds me of a lot of quote-unquote bedroom stuff that I would listen to uh, in the 2000s, but just executed at a much, much higher level than we were used to back then. It's also very, another USBM thing is it's very physical and uh, has powerful, it has powerful low end. Right, uh, in a way that's very unusual um, for stuff that has these kinds of chords in it. Um, yeah, these are and, these are typically played with that thin kind of jangly sound. There's none yeah. of that here, and in a sort of immediate proximity to punk in terms of a certain kind of simplicity in a way of structure in songs, which is again you find that obviously there's punk all over Finn Black too, right? But like you find it much more directly in your Vons or your Judas Iscariots or your GBKs or whatever, right? Um, uh, so, should I get into the song structure stuff? Yeah, because I well, yeah, because that'll actually lead into the the kind of question I was going to ask you, which was, you know, I wasn't sure how you were going to feel about this because to me, much of this record is very, as we say on the show, gestural to me. Um, and I guess that's kind of an abstract term that we've used a few times on the show. And I guess gestural to me means a lot of these riffs and melodies are 
sort of like deliberately pared down forms of more elaborate riff ideas we've heard in other places. Mm -hmm. It kind of gestures to a more complex melodic idea, but it's mostly hanging out within the root notes of that idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's been records I brought onto the show. I really like those kinds of riffs. Mm -hmm. You're much more hit and miss with them, but it seems like you like them in this case, or maybe you don't see them as gestural at all. So, uh, if well, I, I guess, yeah. yeah, I guess there's stuff like that that is. Um, I guess there's two so that I think you like things that come into that category, and then I would divide it into two things: mm -hmm. things that are like empty forms, things that are sort of like the uh, the outlines of other riffs. Right, that this sort of like like here the riff is being played, but what you're really hearing is a type of riff whose content hasn't been filled in, and that's common in the kind of grid written Franco Finnish melodic black type stuff where you get like a okay here this kind of riff goes here okay that kind of riff goes there, um, and they, they sort of like the, you're hearing like immediate stock riffs, but um. The other side of it is stuff that is intensely minimalist, and it's not that it's like, it's not that it's sort of, as I would hear it, kind of hollow, it's that it's been sanded down and reduced, mm. and reduced in ways where there's an idea there. And, you know, sometimes in reducing, you get, um, I think this is a band where, you know, even though many of the basic gestures are very familiar from the, you know, big hook riffs and finished stuff, um, in paring it down so much, it really starts to change and stops being, for instance, as much about uh, flowing memorable melodies and becomes more about using that kind of chord in this dense and harmonic way. Does that make sense? I think so, and I think what you're getting at segues us nicely to talking about the structural conceits of these songs, which I think are a big part of what make these work. I think I think this is a record that in less refined hands could be terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's a, an, a very smart, very subtle kind of songwriting at work here. Yeah. That you, this is like really deep cut black metal. You have to listen to a shit ton of black metal to understand why this is particularly good, I would say. Yes, this is also, although I think it's possible that if you heard it for the first time, you'd just be like, this band has a certain something. I just don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it's cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to really dig into it, it's it's written it's written by a connoisseur for, for people who've spent a lot of time with this stuff. Um, it's, yeah, so I'd say like, it's not that the riffs are undercooked, it's that they're rigorously reduced. And, you know, one sign of that, for instance, is that the chords are often denser and more nuanced than the stuff you get in Finn Black, mm -hmm. right? We both noticed that. He has a very unique, unique way, unique harmonic palette, sort of complexity and tension in it, uh, and a distinctive way of playing guitar. We'll get into all that. But yeah, there's the way of structuring it is really special. Um, so this is one of those albums, you know, Death Metal Guy and I both like stuff that is monochrome and relentless, right? You know, it's yeah. like the whole record is the whole record is made from the same substance, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, um, you know, one of your, what, what's the really, really, one of the really abstract Brutal Death records. Yeah. Oh, we can always just go back to Induced, you know? I was, yeah, something like Induced or, um. You know, or for me, like you know, the 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 hate forest or Iljarn or whatever. But this is this is monochrome and relentless, and yet it has like the best records in those styles. It has clearly demarcated memorable parts. Um, and what's key is this kind of gestural approach to songwriting, uh, where like each song is marked by a single characteristic gesture. Um, and they're kind of structured like hardcore songs with the bare minimum to make them more than hardcore songs and a little more like black metal. So let's listen to some samples and we can get into it more. Yeah, sure. Uh, 
Well, yeah, because I've actually got structural things to say about my first one. Um, mm-hmm. I want to listen to a song called We've Lost Our Souls. We're just going to listen to the whole thing. It's pretty short. It's just over three minutes. But I think to point out the structural things we're interested in, we got to listen to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So this is, in essence, a three riff song. There's an A and a B, and then there's a, a C that is sort of a mutated sequence of riffs. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're gonna have you're gonna have this A B A, and then into an elaborate C sequence, which I think is a, a structural idea we're gonna hear a lot across this record. Um, but it's amazing just how fine tuned all of these riffs are. Uh, so let's just listen to this track, and we'll we'll discuss it when everyone's familiarized with it. So you can see that, so I described that as a three riff song where the C is kind of a sequence. Clearly that's all designed to be listened to as like a single passage, those final three riffs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and this is a thing that keeps happening on this record. There's a, an A-B relationship and then the back half of the song in a lot of cases will be dominated by a kind of sprawling C arrangement not unlike that uh, Sargeist split that we covered last week. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it, it's interesting. Um, plus, the, the individual arrangements of these riffs are interesting. Uh, I definitely want to talk about the opening one, which is this three against two 
um, five measure riff very similar to that Narboleth record we liked a lot last year which always has this trailing like odd number sequence uh, like on half the riffs across this record mm-hmm. there's very mm-hmm. little that's actually 4-4 four, four. it's almost all 5 or 7-4 um, and I think there's something in the water because we're hearing a lot more of that lately um, so really it's not that individually like root note by root note there's anything especially unique about the interval choices but the density of the cording the arrangements of the riffs and this kind of subtle interaction between them across the course of the song really elevates this above what you might just hear in a 30 second skim yeah i can really hear the similarity to narboleth now that you mention it obviously this is much more stripped down and less elaborate but it's understated in the same way Mm -hmm. it actually emphasizes rich warm guitar tone in a similar way here that warmth is being used to generate more kind of um weight and violence but uh the the similar tone and similar yeah richness and complexity in the cording you know lots of strings in the chords uh lots of sort of really taking advantage of the fluid slide maneuvers from chord to chord in this style. Uh, and you know what you said about the three against five thing, that or three against two thing, that's really cool. And that's just a four, four stuff, right? It's just like a four, four riff divided into like yeah, five that, measures in four, four. Yeah. It's five measures of four, four. Yeah. So that is really cool. Um, and I didn't notice that, but it makes sense. Cause it has that sort of whiplash turnaround thing. Um, you know, why is this... In, you, you In the notes you say this is kind of in the water lately. Yeah, well, I think something I've been thinking about is, like... You could say that given that we're, God, 30 years into black metal now... At least it, if you count the 80s more than that, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It's, um... We're entering kind of often cultural forms, like literary forms or musical forms. Enter a Baroque phase, like lowercase b, where things get, you know flowery and complicated Mm -hmm. um you know you're late in the development of a form you start reaching for variation in certain kinds of you're not all the you know many of the basic building blocks have already been made right and you're sort of uh reaching for newness by elaborating on things or increasing complexity and that happens in better and worse ways uh and, you know, the, the peril is that it can lead to decadence and over-refinement. Like the emphasis on ext- extraordinarily long flowing melodies that come from all these people copying Vothana, right? Yeah. You know, they, they think it sounds hard and it sounds weak, right? You 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 call it a friendly cat, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and you can see it happening in more high-budget mellow black stuff, right? Or you can see the good version of this you can see a similar tendency maybe with more rigor and less baroque in a bad sense in stuff like into oblivion or the hessian firm bands which like really embrace length and complexity right um so this is a thing where like you know doing kind of weird change-ups like this is a thing that could only happen now, right? There's no reason to do stuff like that back in the day when you're just, like, putting ripping riffs in thrash formats, yeah. right? Uh, so it's um, it could only happen now, and it's a clever way of doing it because instead of just throwing a ton of notes in your melody um, and making sort of saccharine noodly shit, right, uh, or... Or making really long songs. He's doing the opposite. He's paring it down to elemental essentials and changing form, changing structure. Not in ways that are kind of artificial, but in ways that, or elaborate, but in ways that generate variation, even when you're writing exactly the same kinds of riffs in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it, very smart. Yeah. How do we, how do we restructure these kind of elemental ideas in interesting ways now that we have new technology you know sort of like how do we bring modern black metal melodic ideas back into kind of primitive second wave forms yeah that's the cool thing right it's a charging primitive sec the the whole ethos of this and the whole minimalism is pre 
primitive second wave the the charging four four beats and stuff right you know but like it's being the innovation is happening even though it is this late genre benefit of hindsight move towards complexity it's it's the opposite of over refinement and it's this kind of work on structure that's where the real potential for newness comes in same with the into oblivion stuff it's not just like they're adding new notes to the melodies right they're not just adding more notes to the melodies they're like changing how the melodies work by doing strange things with time right yeah and that's why their music also sounds kind of ancient and originary right yeah and this band is this band is doing that in a much more understated way so the more this is one of those where the it's like the narboleth the more we i think we both listen to and talk about this the more we like it yeah definitely well what have you um, what have you got for samples um uh, this one is a great title. There's also some great titles here. You can tell these guys are like actually into Satan, like in the <laughs> like in the cool way, and like the early it, it, true to this early 2000s thing. They're not artificially separating the Satan stuff from the sad stuff. Yeah. So it's hard being Satan, uh, <laughs> and it's and, and it's even harder following his path as as a mortal. So um, this one is uh, my last sample is called Lucifer's Tears, but um. <laughs> A lot of this seems to have to do with just, like, dying, and it's, like, sad but kind of chill. Um, <laughs> and so this one is called I'm Your Guide. It's about, like, talking to it. It's like being the psychopomp. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so about the structural stuff, um, well, we've already introduced it a lot, so I'll talk about the format more after this. Um, uh, what we're going to... We're going in in the middle of this short track... You've already heard a long A riff, highly repeated, you know, highly repeated. It's that's the sort of um main main riff to the song. It's kind of a DSBM riff. And then we go into this kind of like Gravelandy gallop riff, and there's this darker bri- there's this more blasty second wavy bridge, and we're starting in the middle of that. All right. Um, and then we're going to listen to the rest of the track. So this is I'm your guide. <laughs> So there's about like 25 seconds left in that, but we're just fading out there because it basically keeps rocking that out. Um, there you hear exactly the kind of thing that the death metal guy was pointing to, which is that, uh, okay, this is a four riff song, basically. There's riff A, riff B, riff C. Uh, we come into the middle of riff C, we drop back to riff A. Um, riff A 
um, then doesn't go back to Riff B or Riff C at all. We just drop into a build section, and the build section is this new riff that is this sort of another hybrid thing where we start out with a sort of like pulsed, you know, uh, just, you know, one half step, one half step kind of thing. And this sort of more colorful, strange cording on the end that blossoms off the end of it. And then we think that's going to a new riff, and instead it just, just turns into a drop. And it turns out, oh, this is the next riff. <laughs> it, just, it just becomes this, like, Avski kind of throwdown riff, right? Unlike so much stuff made today, you can actually headbang to a lot of this record. Yeah. Um, and uh, that last riff, it's like what you said. It's actually a sequence, but it's, like, basically the one last riff. And that is the rest of the song. Um... And it becomes, you hear the, you know, it starts on da 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 It does one of these sort of more turnarounds, and it probably goes through like four different iterations where the turnaround is chorded differently each time. Yeah. Um, it's really subtle. Um, and yet, the song is just, just, you know, hewn from rock simplicity in a lot of ways. Um... So here's a good example of, like, w w gestural in a good sense. Like, you could really use that keyword that, you know, that, that I think is your, it's your keyword, but I think it really works here to describe a positive thing. Like, uh, the song starts out with that kind of, like, you know, da, 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 over the double bass, right? And it's kind of, you can hear that as a, you know... Uh, finish riff, but it all, really its mood is much more DSB, and that's kind of like a nostalgia riff, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's it's just maybe yeah, nostalgia is pretty aggressive, but maybe just a bit burlier here, right? And that is the memorable riff for the song. Right? That's the cool main riff, um, and uh, what it is is a. Uh, that's not the hook, right? It's not like the chorus. It's not it's not complex or whatever. There's no structure that works to deliver that riff. It happens once, it repeats a ton. There's a brief riff too, there's a transition riff. It comes back again for a minute and then we're in the throwdown riff. Um and it's more like a it, it's not a hook. It's like and, you know, we don't build to it, right? There's not, like, some thrashing part, and then we get to the release, or anything like that. It, it's a seed for the song, or the the, the whole song just fl go, it starts there, it goes from that one, and a bunch of stuff, and, you know, these few things happen. It gets the song, and it's like the, gets the song moving, and it's kind of the sonic tag for the memory. So we understand, oh, this is the one with that riff. And so I guess you know, your word is like, okay, that's the gesture. And the song starts from that gesture, and that gesture sort of throws the song into the air, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's mm -hmm. like it's this germinal idea of every song. All, all of these songs mm -hmm. are based on a single riff, and then it's exploring territory around it that's naturally related to it. Um, and I think that what makes this so good... You know, there's a lot of stuff melodically in Black Metal that is about exploring the natural territory of a certain melodic sequence. Um, mm -hmm. Here, I, I think that what makes that work is how minimal it is. You know, because there are, you know, from any of these germinal melodies, there's a thousand different places you can take them. And it feels like a lot of bands nowadays are trying to use 500 of them at any given time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here, it's like they're hyper-selecting just a couple to play around with. The absolute most compelling ones they could find off of yes. a lot of exploration. Uh, which makes them minimal, but makes them special and rigorous in the way of second wave black metal. Yeah, think how many, um, you know, like, think how many riffs were thrown out making this. Yeah, no, it's like, I, uh, I, I know that feeling, because, I mean, at a certain point, if you've been playing guitar long enough, you can come up with a certain kind of melodic black metal riff, 
And just fucking around, you can come up with 30 variations. How do you select the one that sticks? I think nowadays a lot of people don't. It's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, and that's how you end up with the empty gesture. Yeah, it's it's sort of like that that yeah. joke from Michael Scott in the Office. It's like you know, I I love opening lines and speeches, so sometimes I like to try five or six of them in a row. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's the same logic with riffs. It's like I can't decide which of these melodic yeah. spins is the best, so let's just fucking sequence all of them together. Yeah, and okay, and I think between this, what what's in common between this sample and yours, right? People can now hear how these are sort of like hardcore songs that have just that little bit extra to make them black metal. Oh, yeah. It's like we're writing three to four minutes. We're writing like three minute songs. The longest track on the main body of the album is four minutes. Um, three minute less or less sometimes I think um, songs, and they have a they have that gesture. They have an answering riff. Maybe they do the gesture again in certain ways. Maybe they don't. But they have, you know, a few alternating riffs. They don't alternate neatly in a hardcore way. Like, here's A, B, A, B, maybe C, A, B, or whatever, right? Uh, or, you know, I guess if you're a hardcore song, you should structure it A, C, A, B, or something. Um, ho, 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 ho. Um, but, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Oh, sorry. Um, but um, but like you know, they, they don't have rote hardcore structure, even just in that little initial sequence. But then there's always that C riff at the end, and it's analogous to the big back end stonker that you get in a second wave song, or mm. in you know, or in a, a Finnish song, or a lot of the Slavic songs, right? But it's just like you have the initial delivery system and then you just sort of rock out on this long thing and you sort of deliberately hit a holding pattern but it's not a holding pattern because there's constant variation under it and it's kind of just it's always kind of just like forceful yeah i can see that Mm -hmm. so we've talked about structure a lot but you know to kind of like roll us out with our last couple of samples let's just talk kind of harmonic ideas because that's Mm -hmm. one of the big things that makes this special um because this would be a cool record if all of this was just blunt, kind of um, carefully arranged two-string power chord stuff. But it's not that. It's a lot more complicated. So I'm going to go to a song called Falling. And this is going to be a sample that's just two riffs. And each of these riffs could be very stock mm-hmm. kind of black metal sequences if we just broke it down to root notes and we did regular power chords. But there's an incredible amount of harmonic depth. I don't know if it's just in chord phrasing or if it's uh, interplay between two guitar tracks, but you'll hear very quickly, you know, you'll trace the line of a theoretical normal riff underneath this, and you'll hear something much more special.
that's actually a three riff sequence. I was gonna say you lied. Yeah, we're just well. The thing is, they're they're constantly playing around with like five fucking notes per song, <laughs> and just augmenting the shit out of them with you know various chord phrasings. Um, so that's a really interesting sequence. That's one of the few like just straight A B C sequences on the record. But the thing is, everything's so drawn out. I thought we were kicking back to the origin. No, we're kicking into something like an augmented take on the original he, idea. He returns to the same chords, the same basic chords, but instead he's like driving them down these descents to more sort of power chordy notes. And there it starts to sound like a kind of aggressive blast riff. Well, yeah, they're um, almost like that final riff is almost like a, a weird sort of more aggro take on like an old druid griff or something yeah i think the opening riff is quite druidky too um i think there's a lot of slavic stuff kind of dotted around this record actually just the way he likes to hang on these kind of open ringing chords for a long time yes and there's a mastery of drone which i'll get into on my thing um, and, you know, that's something that ties it back to the grieve from last week. It's like, okay, people who are interested in... Fi- people realizing that the Finnish and Slavic thing sort of can offset each other's limitations in certain ways. Yeah, well, I think mm-hmm. something is interesting because some, another technique that's been forgotten, and this is one of those, you know, the, the smartest things you can say about music are stupid questions asked at the right time. Something that's been forgotten in black metal is just sitting on a chord for a long time. Like, maybe a Mm -hmm. little longer than you're comfortable with. Um, But so many great black metal riffs are fundamentally based on that idea. Like, half of early Dark Throne is based on sitting on a single chord. Burzum. Burzum, of course. Um, Even there's parts of Emperor that are like that. Just these kind of Yeah, yeah, enslaved. The... Yeah. There's this, yeah, and that's related to them being at the root of the style in this very elemental territory where they're not concerned about artificial variation. And this band, Isatai, really understands kind of that originary thing. Like, they, they're they like, we could just hold the chord longer and that would be really heavy. Like, you listen to early 2000s shit and just melodies are formed that way in just a way they aren't anymore. Oh, yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, on your last sample, how I see this as intensely USBM in a way, just because the particular way that they will sit on chords and ideas is very similar to, like, early demoncy. Mm -hmm. Early demoncy is much more focused on, like, just truly bizarre kind of demonic interval choices, but -hmm. the way they sink into a power chord and kind of let your play tricks on your brain like they're hanging out on it so long you're hearing dimensions that aren't even there some of that has transferred into this music i think you're absolutely right which brings to mind like this is one of those things that's so unique that a lot of the best comparisons don't immediately sound like it yeah so it sounds like demoncy and you know what else it sounds like that sounds like demoncy is that cake we reviewed from last year yeah yeah that's that's true yeah in terms of being something that's hyper minimal but actually extremely sophisticated and has really uh you know sort of like rich dense aggressive low end tone and really carefully thought out uh cording. yeah no i agree and you know mm-hmm. and like the kayak i really like covering this isatai record on the show because this is the kind of thing where it would be so easy for someone skimming through bandcamp to listen to 20 seconds of a song and just let it breeze by them and they move on to the next thing. You know, it's important to have a place like this where we can insist on this as actually being as good as we say, you know? Yeah, no, this is, I mean, this is, you know, this is one of those records where, I mean, it's not like we haven't said this before. This is one of those records where it's like, oh yeah, this is why we do the show. Yeah, it really is. But Uh, Drone... Take, take us out, Black Metal Guy. What do we got? Ah, yes, Drone. So, not much more to say except, like, you know, cool. Uh, we, we've covered a lot, right? Oh, I would also say about Falling. Like, Falling is just, like, four minutes, like, a little bit longer. In terms of the thing that have this super minimal format, that is, like, the complete... So- a lot of these other ones have the, the gestural thing where it's like, here's our thing, and then we rock out on this one idea. Falling feels more like a quote-unquote complete song in miniature in a way that's, like, pretty elegant. 
Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, and cool, but um, and the other thing that does that in terms of, and then there's there's one track that really fleshes it out called "Death of the Physical Body," um, which is the second to last track, and I guess it has a guest vocalist on it, Skull of Hellgoat. <laughs> yeah, um, Hellgoat are cool, man. You'd like them. Oh, I don't know them. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing you would dig, just like nasty, minimal. USBM brushed with like this touch of thrash. It's cool. Are his vocal? Is he the vocalist? You know, is is he doing the uh, on, like on Helga? I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Helgoat is doing vocals here, right? Guest vocals. Okay. So the vocals are good for sure, and the song is just longer and more elaborate, and it has the kind of warmth that you hear the kind of yearning vibe you get in the chords on Falling, and it really expands on that. It's quite beautiful. It's honestly kind of moving. It ends on a passionate note. Here's another kind of emotional one, Lucifer's Tears, which speaks to that sort of DSBM and Slavic inflection throughout this. Uh, listen to the drone on here. Um, and it's not it's not where you think or you're expecting. So Lucifer's Tears. so good it's so fucking good dude we yeah yeah i I lowered the volume so i could hear a death metal guy go just like these riffs are so good (laughs) but so let's vote and what that one is is basically two main gestures each of which right the sort of uh um the droning riff and the more punky one each of which is followed by a variation that is basically like a black metal beat down um the first variation is almost has like that fluids symbol thing going on. It's very cool, deliberate use of drum machine. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, so let's talk about the riffing, really. So the, the thing that de- this whole song is built in a way around an interval, which is just this this drone that comes in. It sounds almost like an overtone, but you can tell he's playing the string. It's brang brang. You know, the the root note is like. Bum, blum, blum. And it, it's, it's this thing that hits over it like brang, brang, brang. And I think what it is, it's an octave plus a whole step. Mm-hmm. So like a second, but elevated really high. And it comes in, and the, the beginning of the riff is he's digging on, on the down. The riff is this sequence of three of these sort of um, black metal rama lama sort of... Um, Grace note riffs, right? Bum, 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 bum. But he's got the drone over the the grace note riff, and he's just digging in so that the drone sounds like a trumpet 
over that more grinding power chord riff. So, um, and he just complete. You know, another thing that's cool, like the holding chords longer thing, just repeating things more in the way that people <laughs> used to. Right? There's no. He's not at all beholden to the sort of habits people have run into. The sort of hook driven verse chorusy thing. He plays that riff like sixteen times. Um, and as it goes on, you can start hearing him changing that three-note turnaround at the end, introducing different color in the chords. Um, and although I describe this as sounding kind of melancholic, mostly just because of that sort of wistful, nuanced thing with that drone there, it's hard as fuck.
right, we are back with our final record of the night. And uh, like I said up front, this is a this is an episode that's like old school Terminus 2020, just all independent stuff. So we've got another independent record for you. Uh, this time from a, an older band, uh, I guess in a sense, than uh, Isatai. Uh, this is Dead Life, a one-man project from Sweden who has been around since 2010. Uh, and this is... Three, four, five, how many is this? Six, seven, eight. It's the ninth full-length record by this project, uh, titled The Darkening. And this is going to be interesting to talk about, because it'll uh, revolve around some stuff we've talked about on the show before. So, I brought this onto the show, but Black Metal Guy, what kind of music is this? Yeah, well... Uh... That's the crux of the whole thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Metal Archive says DSBM, right? And it's, uh... Okay, I guess I get how it could be, right? And sort of slow-paced, and there are many riffs on this that could be black metal riffs, and there are, you know, high, distorted, screamy vocals... Um, the only thing that really screams a specifically DSBM thing to me is the vocals, which sound like Cold World. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that the name is kind of like a Cold World reference to it, right? Dead Life. It's like life, but it's dead. <laughs> life, but it's dead in yeah. a world. That's like the world, but it's cold. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I hear that, but, you know, you, you wrote in the notes that you think this has isn't really, you know, why are we calling this black metal and that it speaks to something broader about DSBM in general, which we've touched on before, but let's go for it. Yeah, so something we've talked about, and we're not the very first people to notice it. I, I've seen some smart people on the internet talk about it before, but DSBM as a whole, well, one, has meant many different things over the years. Um, in terms of imprecise genre categorization it's it's near the top uh, dsbm can refer to mictalgia which is like a very sad but incredibly aggressive black metal band it can refer to bethlehem who do abstract kind of tortured doom black stuff kind of like what into the pandemonium wanted to be right? yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty yeah. much or uh mm. it can refer to stuff like nocturnal depression uh, which is probably closer to what mainline DSBM sounds like these days. But we think one of the things at the root of it is uh, Peaceville Doom Death, uh, specifically stuff like Catatonia's Brave Murder Day, that we see as, even though in theory outside of black metal, is really one of the root influences to this entire style. And this Dead Life record in particular, I would say, completes the circle. And it is, in essence to me, a Peaceville Doom Death record with a black metal aesthetic. I think there is very little on this record that is specifically black metal. And in a sense, this probably has a lot more to do with, you know, Tiamat's Wild Honey or the kind of transitional records by Amorphous than it really does black metal at all. Yeah, so first of all, I gotta say, we are using um, Peaceville Doom Death in a kind of generic way, right? Because um, I'm, I'm looking back to confirm it, but Brave Murder Day is actually out on avant-garde music. The same avant-garde that's still going today in Italy. Yeah, in I, always consider, I always consider Catatonia to be part of that school, along with... No, I think that's fair. I think we... Yeah. I think we should just point that out to people. It's like, uh, so... Yeah, that's fair. Like, doom death can mean a bunch of things, too. Famously ambiguous. It can mean boring death metal. It can mean awesome death metal, like Ripaculo. <laughs> um, and it... Which is also, like, fast. Um, it, it can mean... Uh, uber crust, like winter. Or it can mean, you know, stuff like this. Which is basically, like, you know, goth death metal or something. Um... And, uh, yeah, so this is, what was the first, two, what was early Tiamat on, too? Let's see, what's, what's, what's Wild Honey on? That's already on Century, Century Media by that point. But, um, Clouds, 
Century Media. Okay, yeah, they're just Swedish as fuck. So, but basically this constellation of, yeah, sort of romantic death doom bands, I... I think that's right. Yeah, and, you know, like, Catatonia, right, I think is a huge influence on this band in particular. Uh, and, you know, which makes sense, because Sweden. Um, and, uh, and you know, Tiamat, Sweden as well. I guess it's a scene that really exists between England and Sweden. Yeah. Um, and uh, even even later bands like Draconian or whatever, I think those are, they're Swedish as well. Or uh, So, um... But, um, but like, uh, I was just listening to Brave Murder Day again because we were doing this review and some other Catatonia stuff. And it's like, it sits in this weird, we've talked about this with like Peaceville, like you could consider DSBM the filling the Peaceville niche. And you could also consider Peaceville like, you know, kind of black metal-y, right? The thing that separates it is like, it's more... You know, there's some undigested death metalisms in it, and but that's all surface stuff. You can get that in plenty of black metal too. And it's more just introspective, right? It's more moody and personal. Yeah. Um, and and Brave Murder Day is this really weird record. There's just I like it's a masterpiece. I rate that band higher all the time. It's like it's it an has amazing album. Yeah, it it has like. You can see why he stopped doing this stuff because I think after that he was just like, okay, I've, I mean, okay, I know how to do riffs. It's done. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The song twelve has like maybe it's got twelve riffs in it. I don't know, maybe for twelve hours, but it's got an astonishing number of just like the best riffs ever thrown one after another in a way that seems discontinuous and just works. But like the record, right? It's not really doomy. It's not. It's basically sort of like death metal and sort of like black metal. You can tell he's paying attention to Burzum, but it's a lot like goth rock too, and it's sort of like none of those things. So we're pointing at some sort of nebulous thing that is like its own genre, and DSBM might some DSBM is part of it, and this clearly is. Well, I, I, I would I would say that in a sense that a lot of this style is. It, well, probably early on, at least, was a way to smuggle goth rock into heavy metal. And not in a bad way, but yeah. in an era where goth itself would probably be fundamentally repellent to a lot of metalheads. Um, yeah, yeah, pla- yeah. Placing a lot of those motifs uh, within this kind of heavier context made them palatable in a way that maybe they couldn't be otherwise. Yeah, you could see it. I mean, you could see it as the development of goth into extreme music. Like, there's like 80s goth rock, which exists as part of the punk ecosystem, and then it, or post punk or whatever, and then it goes in several different directions, right? Uh, and from Fields of the Nephilim and from like the, you know, like the back end of the Cure's disintegration or whatever, you start see goth becoming something more like extreme music. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you can also see the reverse where most of these bands, Catatonia, Paradise Lost, Tiamat, all ended up, Amorphous as well, all ended up moving in more or less a goth rock direction over the years. About the only one that stayed on top of exactly what they were doing from the start was My Dying Bride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like it gives away what was going on to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, yeah, so so that all makes sense. So, okay, so maybe there's this species of blacky, deathy, melancholy metal that's kind of getting its basic forms and melodic ideas from goth. And let's, I guess, take that and listen to this sort of very one man right sort of this is a sort of limited in a lot of ways but it's also got a lot of really really good riffs on it yeah that's true well i guess Mm -hmm. we'll we'll just start with the beginning of the album which i Mm -hmm. think tells the whole story i got a two and a half minute sample off a downhill journey and this is to me the thesis statement is dsbm does it actually refer to depressive black metal or at this point is it an island of its own.
<laughs> You're just going to keep listening, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Just thinking about my life, man. <laughs> so even structurally, that is extremely um, post-transition peaceful. Uh, you know, the way the uh, broader, heavier riff drops out into that kind of muted version of itself when the vocals come in. I mean, mm -hmm. these are kind of goth metal techniques, and goth metal is always just goth rock, but heavier, fundamentally. Um, that being said, all the discussion about form and genre aside, these are great fucking riffs, man. <laughs> yeah, man, we were saying when that first one comes in, you know, da, 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 da. I said to Death Metal Guy, this is a this is a riff that became so cliche that everyone forgot about it. And this uh th this this ballsy son of a bitch has dug it up from the, the DSBM graveyard and reminded <laughs> us why why it is so good. Yeah, and then right? the uh, the play on it, the second version that I'd say that's that's wonderful. That's like a that's like a hanging gardens riff, mm -hmm. um, and that's yeah, the chiming <laughs> thing. It answers it. Yeah, yeah. If you threw like a little like chiming harpsichord key patch behind that, there you go. You're done. You know, oh. um, it's so. What's fascinating about this is that it it works so well in both regards and that's why i'm thinking maybe dsbm at this point is just the reincarnation of this style um obviously th this guy is working with uh like any dsbm that you have to, anything that you have to use that tag for right like you don't have to call nictalgia dsbm you don't have to call well, nothing sounds like Bethlehem anymore, right? But you don't have to yeah. call that DSBM. I guess the thing that would be like Nick Talcher would be like Kaltatod or something. You don't have to call that DSBM. Um, yeah. This, there's no other word for this except you could just call it Gothic Doom. Yeah, a hundred percent. I I don't see why kind of a scratchy production job and a different kind of wailing vocal performance <laughs> makes, it, <laughs> makes it something apart from that. And so what we get down to is that a lot of it's a matter of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think there is something compelling about listening to this kind of music with this, not to be reductive or dismissive, but aesthetic rapper around it. It does give, uh, if not a different color, a different, uh, a different hue, a different inflection to this kind of stuff. Um, where you can imagine Catatonia playing basically all of these riffs, for them, there would be more body to it. There would be more kind of dramatic longing to it. These slight changes in aesthetic make for something with a lot more kind of finality and uh, somber, wintry resignation, you know? The first riff seems to be more like a My Dying Bride or kind of thing. The second one is like more like Catatonia. Um, there are a lot of big just sort of they they just spin out these sort of grandiose opening statement riffs like you said kind of like thesis riffs that uh i think seem very english yeah. um uh or like the um that riff is also like too um it's too like uh just like rooted in a you know like Renska would play that something like that in a much fancier way right it'd well, be yeah it'd be it'd be more rhythm for instance it would be a lot more rhythmic and i well that's interesting that you say because i think that's one of the things that relates this to isatai and mm -hmm. maybe to black metal in general is mm -hmm. that these are sort of gestural takes on a lot of these melodies that we've heard before like reduced down to just the root notes just plinking away with one finger on the piano yeah. and i think that in the case of this album there is a kind of power to that yeah oh you know also the thing that makes the peaceville bands and that makes kind of tony's like on brave murder day there's like an undercurrent of like serious almost like solstice uk medievalism mm -hmm. to a lot of the melodies that comes to the front more on october tide 
Yeah. And so when he does a noble Dorian scale melody, it's just going to have a different inflection. The thing with this that you can tell it's come through that passage of like being DSBM or whatever is it sounds a lot more modern. The 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 harmonies are more sort of direct and uh you know, have passed through the crucible of MySpace 2001. Yeah. Right? No, I, um, I think that is it's, that is a thing. The, uh, and that's related to what you were saying about the gestural thing because it's also it it can have this you know, the, the music deliberately has less inflection in it, right? It deliberately has this kind of uh, the the DSBM flatness to yeah, it, the, which the, is the monochromatic quality. Of yes, it. which is yes, which is yeah. For instance, like Brave Murder Day is constantly morphing, or like you know, October Tide is just like massive fucking death metal riff, massive fucking death metal riff. Um, you know, or you know, the Paradise Lost stuff is quite discontinuous in a lot of ways, right? Whereas this is, you know, that's why I couldn't turn off the sample, right? I was, like, hypnotized. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the intent. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, so you can hear how a certain kind of, the, the black metal seamless, as you were saying, the surface aesthetic really does do something different. You take those initial things and you process them through berzumic black metal uniformity and you end up with something quite different um uh but building on that tradition and you know the other thing that marks dsbm right as like the, the oh I, I never got around to saying it the thing the thing that marks the dsbm stuff in particular the stuff where you have to use that label for it is these deliberately plotting tempos yeah definitely um and so that right that's this kind of doomy thing maybe we shouldn't call peaceful doom doom either but like there's just <laughs> something right you know uh so let's go to um speak and also of what you're saying about the connection to isatai and gestural writing um uh a lot of these songs work in the same way where they launch from the big gesture and then they uh by the end of the song you hit what i would call the depressive holding pattern riff. Yeah. <laughs> Isatai sort of... Isatai, for Isatai, they're usually more like these highly physical kind of headbang parts that have all these subtle variations thrown in. Here, the idea is that you just have some gorgeous epic melodies uh, and then just you hit this sort of fugue state and you just zone into it and kind of wander on down along the, you know, under the street lights by the river, kind of just ambling, right, <laughs> you know, um, until someone calls the cops on you. Um, <laughs> and so let's go to the end of Spit.
know, I gotta ask, what's the holding pattern riff there? Because all of those sounded pretty sick to me. <laughs> I didn't mean it. No, what I meant is that it just, it's a great riff. This, that one just continues, right? He's doing this subtle variations over it with the other guitar, but that mm. riff just rolls straight through to the end of the song from, like, uh, you know, you're at the... Um, you have the... I imagine you get a lot more out of it on headphones, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. There is... Yeah, despite talking about the relative flatness or whatever of this, the flatness has more to do with the evenness of the performance rather than, like, sound quality. Or the emphasis on this kind of black metalish smooth continuity in the riffs. Um, mm -hmm. uh... It's yes, the sound is great, and one cool thing that happens over that riff at the end, where they just roll it out, is um, like is is the feedback. I was about to say that searing fucking digital feedback. Oh, dude, that is awesome! I wish that was more of that on the other tracks. That's a really distinguishing thing about this. Um, and you know, that's always feedback. I always say this is the kind of thing that black metal bands should use and never do. Um. He's got great control over it. Uh, and He's it comes using it in as part of the riff. Yes. And it comes in first over the trem. And that part is the only unmistakably black metal part on the record. Like, there are tons of riffs here that would work in a black metal context. Throw some blast beats under them and they all work, right? But, yeah. like, <laughs> that's kind of a thing about the peace fill thing as well, right? You know, there's like riffs on Brave Bird or Day where you're like, shit, that's evil. Like, um, <laughs> but, um,. The, but like with this, that trem part is really cool because it's it's got this um, you know that's written in the kind of you know Franco Finnish Satanic War Master kind of vibe, right? But he's got it just over this steady thundery sort of doom backbeat, dong ta dong, and the cool thing is he's not playing eighth notes; he's full tremming that, and he's doing it in a way that grooves with it. And it's got a really good A B variation. Really just it's muscular trem plane there. Um and the feedback sort of swirling over it. If I I would like to hear him just do more shit like that on this record on, on his next record. Yeah, no, I, I think it would be cool. I'd I'd be interested in hearing uh some of this guy's older stuff. I mean he's done a bunch of music. So, mm -hmm. uh, and apparently just looking at him on Metal Archives in, in a ton of projects in general. You know, that's something we're starting to discover. These, like, super prolific guys and a lot of projects, there's usually really cool shit to dig out of them. Um, but Nobody, I, there have been zero Metal Archives reviews of this. Uh, this is... Uh, oh, of this album? or No, no, of this guy. Oh, there is one of Porphyria in 2016. <laughs> yeah, Damn. there's only one. And it's like, why not? Why not listen to these guys? Um... Another thing I was thinking of, uh, as far as what we've covered on the show... Oh, probably... this is the guy in... That's interesting. This guy is in a popular Atmo Black band, which I hate, called Hair Motor. Oh, I'm not even familiar with that. It's, like, maybe a little more black metal -y than some of those other bands, but it's, like... It, it has all the things that I don't like about the style. But that's interesting, because he's also got this. Let's see what else he's in. Maybe he's... But Hermoder is, like, very... Hermoder is very popular. It's, like, that's all over YouTube. Um, it's, like, canonical, atmospheric black metal channel stuff. That's interesting. He, he's in a b bunch of other bands. Abys Tell me if you know one. Mist, Abysmal Silence, Decayer. And these are uh, X projects, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Decayer, Endless Woods, e Gast, Gravesnot, Necrotica, Scar tis Tissue, Sodomizing Christ, Svartsect, Vargheim, Vridsmud, Waste, Eerie Gloom, uh, <laughs> Amuleto de Kamlamidad. Um <laughs> I think and I, then like I think I six that some, aren't in the archives. I think I might have heard some Vargheim at one point, mm -hmm. or maybe the Abysmal Silence demo, but mm -hmm. I'm not a hundred percent. But so, it, well, what I was saying before we got on that tangent was yeah, sorry the thing, for the tangent. The thing this reminds me most of that we've covered on the show is the uh, Thy Light record um, that I brought on mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. early last year, uh, which is 
kind of comparable, except Highlight has this bizarre streak of kind of depressive rock and roll meets Van Halen shit going on in the lead guitar, as well as these <laughs> neoclassical ideas. But the the kind of acceptance of this lineage of kind of peaceful music, we'll call it, uh, seems very uh, consistent between the two bands. Um, but anyway, uh, well, we, you got another sample. You got the next one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's fascinating to know this is the guy from Harry Potter because this this music is so riffy here, and that that stuff is is not riff based. Um, mm-hmm. The um. So this next one is um the title track, the darkening. Um, uh, and do I have? Anything, what, what what do I have to say about this one? I, I, say, I, say, I say in the notes, just, um, I hear a massive catatonian sad rock riff. I nod, mournfully. <laughs> When you play the first four chords of Eaten by Rats by Satanic Warmaster, but you're too sad to continue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's uh just comes out at like one quarter time. <laughs> um uh th- this is that yeah, that's awesome. Right? A thing that he does throughout the record is you just play a elaborate f- a flourishing, just sort of compelling melody. And then he uses it to, like, set up a stock riff. But somehow the stock riff is what he uses for such passionate playing and inflection that it becomes, like, almost the centerpiece of the song. Yeah, Um, yeah. He's he's got a real mastery of, like, how to play these elemental riffs. Yeah, so he does a... And he does that for, like, a minute and 15, right? There's no sense that he needs to, like, do some, like... He's not fucking around with bullshit ideas of songs, right? This guy's playing extreme metal, right? And so he does this 
the thing that Catatonia does so well, which is like when you want to reach for like the big, like later cat, that's like a later Catatonia idea mm-hmm. almost. It's like when you want to reach for the big sentimental thing, you don't half ass it. You don't accidentally do it while trying to be like black metal and hard, right? You fully commit to it and you enfold all of the, all of the darker emotion into the pop hook format, right? You play the massive pop kind of like massive catchy sad rock riff and there's all this underlying intensity in it that there wouldn't be in related things right no, like that and that's a good example that riff you seized onto that octave bounce that mm-hmm. that uh dun, 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 mm-hmm. that's that literally can't be a black metal riff you know it's like we're we're looking around on this record for the riffs that are inarguably black metal riffs that one like can't be fundamentally it, Someone would someone would accidentally do that on a nowadays BM record, and it would make me claw my ears out. Right? Yeah, it's um because that's not the way you're supposed to play it. You're supposed to play in this stately melodramatic way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but so that is so that is awesome. Um, really well done, and uh, it uh, and it then it drops, and we're just in. You know, yeah, dun, 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 dun. yeah, just this processional chord progression. But he's doing little things, adding little notes here and there, and really he's just digging into the the guitar. It's um for somebody who's really committed to one man digital production, this is surprisingly just physical and inflected playing. Yeah, I'm impressed at his Maybe, ability to capture that. I think I started at the beginning saying it has a lot less inflection than Catatonia. And, well, okay, maybe that's true because Catatonia is sort of like full band thing and is going for this kind of dramatic intensity. Uh, And it's kind of like muscular in a way. But, like, this is very inflected, just in a more even BM way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, especially overcoming this kind of, you know, Scarlet Solo production style. Um, mm-hmm. he does an admirable jo- an admirable job of putting the muscle into these riffs that they really need to to make them soar. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's a way to play a lot of these riffs that's much flatter, you know, much more evenly timed. Doesn't have that little bit of swing this guy has that really makes him into something special. Um, but he pulls it off, and I assume that has to do with doing so many records for this project. He has isolated this particular style that he understands the the subtle variations that make this music really good, as yeah. opposed to merely average. And he he like he feels it clearly. Like, yeah, this There's is actual uh, feeling in it. Yes, there is actual depression and actual sort of. Um, and actual sort of ecstatic appreciation of beauty that often happens in these moments of where you feel deeply unmoored from the world. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that that's great. And, you know, the other thing, yeah, I guess I was just saying, he, he repeats that thing, which you would assume would be the transition riff or the filler riff, for almost as long as he plays the massive hook. <laughs> Because they're they're all even to him, man. They're all part of the story. You know? Yeah, I think that's kind of true. The way the songs are is just like there's not really a structural hierarchy here. It's just like here is the first part. Here's A, B. This song is literally just A for a really long time, B for a really long time. You get that little more tense kind of build thing, which is almost a bit like a Lycia riff, like a sort of... Uh, you know what, what? What's it called? Uh, dark, you know, dark wave goth thing. Don't ask me to explain <laughs> the difference. Um, uh, but then we're we go back into the big riff, and that's the song. <laughs> yep. It's it's very just very comfortable with not trying to write with structuring his stuff in a different way, which also taps it into the isatai. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of dark wave, thank you for the segue. Mm-hmm. Um, the last thing we see, uh, this is me offering you the opportunity to spurg out about goth rock for a little while. Um, think, think carefully. If I want to unleash that sort of Ark of the Covenant. G- g- <laughs> give me a sec. I got to get my leather jacket. <laughs> so the last thing we see. So this is just like a, 
I really want to draw attention to, again, like everything else on this record, these riffs are really well chosen, but I want to draw attention to the second riff in this sample, which is this very jangly, very distinctly goth rock thing, and I'm wondering if by now I know enough to identify it as a uh, Fields of the Nephilim kind of thing. Um, but I figure I will... Uh, okay. I will consult you as to uh, what it might actually be. So, black metal guy, I, I, I'm i guessing this based off of a little bit of knowledge that you've given me and a bandmate mm-hmm. of mine who's a huge fan of Fields of the Nephilim and says, it's goth, but it sounds like cowboys and one of the guys wears a big hat. So mm-hmm. I heard a jangly cowboy goth riff. Am I correct or is there a finer distinction there? Um, it sort of could be a Fields of the Nephilim. It's close, but the thing it really sounds like is the style that kind of inspired the Nephilim style. The Nephilim carried it a lot further, I think. They're, I think they're the superior band. But um, Sisters of Mercy. What really? That, God. Yeah. There's this... Um, well, so on... Especially on First and Last and Always, um, I know also in England they say Sisters of Mercy went downhill before then and that the best stuff was like the demos and EPs or so. I, I don't care. <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, they... On First and Last and Always, which is the one before the massive commercial album, Floodland, although Floodland's pretty sick too. It's just party jams. But um, on First and Last and Always, they have this kind of like... The guitar, they have, the guitar almost sounds like a lute in certain parts on there. It's a very unique way of playing, arpeggiated thing. And it, they, they're doing this Western jangle thing, but it's also kind of Euro folk medieval at the same time. To the extent that Dead Life gets medievalism, it's all being routed through sisters, mm. things like that. Okay. Um, and, uh, so and and sister, it's not like Sisters of Mercy has a medieval vibe at all. It'll just be weird. They're like, oh, whoa, that's a sick loot riff or something, um, you know. Uh, so it, this kind of um, what distinguishes it from Fields of the Nephilim is just really subtle things about note choice and the way it kind of turns around, you know. <laughs> It just has that particular thing. Nephilim sounds less looty. I couldn't tell you much more than that. You, it's 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 a uh, you know it's 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 a sort of like know it when you see it thing. God uh, damn it, black metal guy! Let me take my win. I got my cowboy goth. No, I think I think you did. I think you did. You did an excellent job, death metal guy, and I am impressed. Um, oh, thanks, Dad. 
No, it's true. I mean, it's true that you you got it, and um, you know, one thing he does is like. But, you know, like, if you heard that riff on a few... Is there a riff somewhere like that on a Feels the Nephilim record? Probably. Like, maybe on Dawn Razor or something. But the, um... But it's, um... One cool thing it does is this is very rhythmically even music, right? A lot of the rhythm in the music comes from the highly inflected sort of soulful plane. And so moments where there's just kind of like a breakdown like that, where there's a little bit more groove shaken into it, are pretty cool and very effective. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like they always say, the rules of being a cowboy. Be rootin', be tootin', and by God, be shootin'. But most of all, be depressed. <laughs> 